Welcome back, everybody. I hope you have had a moment to stretch your legs, get something to eat or drink. Um, if you haven't, feel free to get something and listen in while you do. We want to make sure that everyone still feels comfortable because we've got a lot to take in. So my name's Leah. I will be your facilitator for this session. Um, so we're going to be having a roundtable discussion about gaining international perspectives on occupational therapy and equity. So with me today, I'm really pleased to introduce Sheila Ivlev and Isla Emery Whittington. Um, you can see their full bios on the symposium platform, but just for the sake of doing small introductions here, Sheila is the founder of Disrupt OT, an international volunteer-based organisation disrupting the status quo of racism and ableism in occupational therapy. And Isla is a PhD candidate with Mesa University researching a Kapapa Maori theory of occupation and practice model of decolonized occupation. So our session is structured around questions. Um, I'll ask each of the panel, but we may all join in. This will happen for approximately half an hour. Once we've finished, we turn to you as the audience and use our Q&A platform, as we've done in previous parts of the symposium, to ask your questions. So you can put your questions and use the Q&A platform at any time whilst we're speaking um, and vote for questions if you see that they're there that you'd like to be asked. So we've left about half an hour for that, so we have good time to answer questions raised from the audience once we've been through the round table. So let's get started. Um, welcome Sheila, welcome Isla, uh, my sisters. It's so great to be on the panel with you today. Um, we've had many a discussion um, over Twitter, but I'm really looking forward to the discussions in this space. Um, so thank you for being here. I'm going to turn to Sheila first. Um, and if you know there's anything short that you wanted to introduce yourself, whether it be pronouns or um, if I've misspelled any names, then please correct me on that. Um, so Sheila, First and foremost, we're going straight in. Why should occupational therapy be urgently integrating anti-racism into the profession, into practice and processes? So the simple answer is racism is killing people. Mm. It, it's an imperative. Um, I can elaborate, but that point has to be the first, um, it has to be heard, it has to be understood. Um, so, you know, if you think it doesn't affect you, if you don't think you have the time, um, recognize that any stalls, any delays, any excuses, you are contributing to the death of people. <laughs> so wow. that, that, that's, um, you want me to keep going? <laughs> keep, definitely keep going, I suppose. And, <laughs> and maybe that's about the call for occupational therapy. You say it's killing people. What does that mean in terms of urgently integrating that into profession and um, practice and, and processes? Yeah, so anti-racism, especially nowadays, it's um, become this term that seems like it's a radical concept. It is not radical. Um, it's just about acknowledging and undoing, right? There's an action. It's not just understanding. It's not just learning. It's um, undoing harms um, from racism, right? Racism has been perpetuated over hundreds of years um, across the continents. Um, so these things result in worse opportunities, um, less resources, uh, poor health outcomes for BAME, BIPOC people, people of color, people of the global majority, um, whatever you want to call us. And so I have to break it down when you say, okay, racism is killing people. You're like, well, as an occupational therapist, I'm not saving lives, right? I'm not performing surgery. I'm not um, prescribing medication, whatever. Um, but you have to understand in practice, racism impacts occupational therapy and who is receiving services, the quality of care that they're receiving. Um, you know, not enough time to get into it, um, but look at racial health disparities. They're not a result of race. They're a result of racism. So systemic racism, um, limiting access to things like quality education, adequate health care, nutritious foods, um, places to be able to um, have leisure, um, clean air, clean water. I mean, look at um, what's happening um, with the climate crisis. We know who's contributing to that, which countries are contributing and which countries 
um, are having the most impact. They're the ones that actually aren't contributing um, to um, the climate crisis. Um, so all of these things directly impact physical and mental health. Um, again, that's thinking about meaningful occupations, um, limiting access to those occupations. Um, mm -hmm. It's not equitable. And then I feel like I could talk about this forever. So I want to give my sister Isla some time to speak. Definitely. Uh, but but I like that. So, so in summary, and correct me if I'm wrong, the idea that actually people are dying and it's about undoing the harm that potentially as, as a profession, our, our protocols and practices could contribute to that. And for some um, turning to Isla, that might be as a bit of a shock, like what as occupational therapies were all about enabling and empowering people. Um, I mean, what would you say in terms of how is contemporary occupational therapy related um, to racism and to colonialism in, it, in itself? What, what would you say to that? Oh, wow. Um, thank you. And um, I just wanted to say um, thank you very much for having me. <laughs> it's, it's a lovely honour to be here and yeah, amongst, amongst the sisters on this panel and um, just yeah, in this space. So yeah, thank you. Kia my tato. Um, so it's a really good question, eh? but it reminds me of, um, thinking of you, Leah, um, uh, of a group that that I used to um, be proud of and co-facilitate in Birmingham when I worked there a long time ago, the detox service, we um, we used to pose a question to a group, um, which was, which parts of the body are affected by alcohol and drug use? And we used to have this body map and the, and the group would all get together and, you know, and they'd put text down and, and they'd talk about all the parts of the body and how alcohol and substance use affected impacted the body um, and then so that so that kind of question oh and then we turn to so which parts of the body are not impacted by alcohol and substance use and of course the answer is nowhere it's all impacted because substances alcohol they get into the bloodstream so in a similar way we could think of what in terms of answering that question about um, how is contemporary occupational therapy related to colonialism, I would stop it up and say, how is it not uh -huh. related to uh -huh. colonialism? Because because colonialism is the it's like in our blood system. It's it's in everything that we do. It's our ways of being and has been this way of being for centuries now. And so um in that sense, um colonialism you know, sometimes we, we're a bit like, well, you know, after it's been enforced and imposed, we then go, okay, but it's just kind of normalized now, it's inevitable, it's taken for granted, this is just kind of how we are now. Um, but I would counter that there are, there are many, many peoples around the world, not just indigenous peoples, that remember a different way of being before colonialism turned up. And we have different ways of uh, different languages, different uh, ways of talking about and relating with the world. So, and, and those living memories of having a different way of being um, means that for us, when we come to occupational therapy, it, it is a colonial experience. Um, and, it's, um, and it's tough to be enculturated into colonialism. Um, and, 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 you know, often it happens for school leavers. So you're 17, 18, 19, perhaps, and can be quite traumatic. So, um, I think really what we need to pause and have a think about is, is why? Why are we continuing to uphold a colonial way of being in this profession? Um, I think that's the, that's the crux. You know, we, we know it does harm. There's heaps of research. Research is happening all the time. But, but the problem is, is that the colonialism also encompasses so many other kinds of oppressions. And um, even, if we, even if we don't want to talk about colonialism, uh, we know for sure racism is a part of it and ableism and um, yes, yeah, so many, so many. So um, I think kind of, I guess I'm kind of provoking on purpose a kind of um, a way of, like I said, we need to do something different. And, and I'm thinking about um, Dave's talk about how it's the collective approach. Um, and yeah, like, like for me, I think that this collective approach, which is what has kind of been happening just naturally because of this pandemic moment, because of climate injustices, um, it has 
brought some great opportunities for us to really think about, okay, so we're going to do things different now. How are we going to do it? We're going to come together. Um, and, you know, and it's possible that once we really figure out and talk about colonialism in a lot more detail with each other, and we decolonize occupational therapy and occupational science, but for me, then we've we've actually contributed so much to this day and age when we've really contributed to how we do this on an everyday kind of level. That's huge. That would be a massive impact. And I think that's our potential. Yeah, definitely. And, and you, you mentioned kind of the everyday. Um, and I wonder in that question about kind of thinking about how contemporary occupational therapy relates to colonialism, because we're thinking about international views as well. What does that look like or an example of what contemporary um, occupational therapy relating to colonialism look like where you practice at the moment, Isla or even Sheila? What does that look like where you're practicing at the moment? So we have some very tangible examples um, that maybe some of us can use to piece things together. Mm. So um, anti-racist marking, you know, having an, a, a rubric or matrix of marking assignments where um, you've you've actually got an algorithm, you've got uh, designed in, like um, like Ellen was saying, you've got to design the, uh, the space. So you design an anti-racist marking into the assignments um, and you audit continuously how uh, fieldwork placements um, occur in our experience for people of color compared to uh, white people. Um, so it's, yeah, it's, uh, to me, it, it's so wonderful how we can think about the everyday as occupational therapists, you know, and we, and we um, even just uh, thinking about how we commute, to how we get around, you know, we can uh, bring a decolonial lens to it by, like, like for me, when I go past um, natural um, like, like uh, rivers, uh, the sea, and mountains. I will greet them by name, which is our um, our Māori way, our indigenous way of being in a space. Is that you greet um, the the grandparents in that in that sense. And um, you know, so I've just kind of I've decolonized my commute, <laughs> if you like. You know, I've just spent a moment not thinking about that space as real estate. Or that space as the leisure um, tourist space. You know what I mean? Yeah. Hope that makes a little bit of sense. No, it does. It does. And it, it's really interesting, kind of that how do we actively decolonize some of those everyday practice steps? So I, I thank you for speaking to that, Isla. So Sheila, thinking about kind of the groups um, that are about at the moment, as we mentioned, um, being one of the founders of Disrupt OT, how are groups like Disrupt OT and similar ones assisting with that kind of promoting and delivering equity in action in occupational therapy? Again, thinking about the practical everyday things, but this is has been like an, an international global um, kind of scale. So I wonder if you could speak to that for a bit and I'm sure Isla can come back in and, and add as well. Um, so I, I definitely have to shout out um, the different collectives in occupational therapy that are in existence now. Um, obviously, BMOT UK, um, and I, I have to say this, I'm gonna list all these organizations and you have to realize that there's no funding, there's no support. You know, it starts with one person um, who <laughs> really gives everything. And if, if these networks are sustained, it's because there's usually one, two, maybe three, um, rarely more than that people that are putting in the work every single day so um, shout out to um, Mish for keeping this going I know that um, Mish and Kwaku are co-founders and there are several of you that are supporting this symposium um, but people when, when we list these organizations they're doing great work you need to know who's actually doing the work behind it um, it's not a lot of money there usually is no money it's not a lot of people it's um, it's a handful of individuals that are never sleeping, that are constantly stressed out. Um, so BAME OT UK, the Maori OT Network, um, Indigenous OT Consortium, Lab ICE, um, African Studies Laboratory, SexGen OTOS, ABLE OT UK, LGBTQIA OT UK, Matuya um, out of Brazil. And so there, there are these networks that exist um, and work is being done. So definitely check them out. Um, and so, you know, 
Um, Leah, thank you for the introduction. I also have to say thank you. I never said thank you for the invitation um, for allowing me to be here um, with everybody um, and for all the hard work that's been put into uh, this symposium. Um, and so you've already kind of highlighted what Disrupt OT does. Really, we're covering things um, that isn't covered in OT education and training. Um, you know, you mentioned ableism, racism, settler colonialism, resisting oppressive forces, just like um, Juman um, talked about earlier, um, and just these realities that don't fit neatly into the medical model, right? Like we want so badly to fit into this medical model and be relevant. Um, and so these things don't fit neatly in there. And so what Disrupt OT is doing, um, all of these organizations are doing amazing work. I can speak for Disrupt OT and we're highlighting work that's being done um, in communities that don't have a platform um, for whatever reason. Um, and it's not for whatever reason. You really should ask yourself, what is the reason, right? Why aren't these people who are doing amazing work across the globe being platformed, right? Um, and thinking about things like British and American textbooks um, being taught across the world, um, where English is a primary language, um, Western ways are the norm, even though that's not um, how the community lives, um, that, you know, the, this OT programs are being taught to. Um, and so we're living, living in these diverse societies, right? We've got um, New Zealand, UK, and the US represented here. That's where we're practicing. Um, and so these teachings don't apply to everyone, right? We've got people in our communities that aren't from um, Western backgrounds um, that may not even speak English or may not speak English fluently. Um, and so what we're doing is kind of pushing these issues, asking hard questions, asking people to be uncomfortable because we can't ignore these realities. Um, and just like Isla said, we're working together in communities um, We've I named all these organizations, um, haven't contacted everybody, but most of these organizations um, are people that I'm working with. We're, we're trying to brainstorm how can we work together as a collective? How can we have um, more united power? Um, and the biggest thing, just like you're doing here today, is we're making information accessible. Um, we're not gatekeeping. We're making it free so everyone can access. There's a lot of elitism um, in occupational therapy, especially, especially occupational science, right? You ask somebody, what does an occupational therapist and an occupational scientist look like? Um, it, we're not represented. Um, so I'm, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to pause <laughs> so that Isla can have a chance to chime in. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to bring Isla in because you, you mentioned kind of about things that aren't spoken about or taught about in, in OT education and, and as educators as well, um, on the call, I wonder what role that has to play, um, Isla in terms of these, these organizations that are we, and, and in, as my Jamaican heritage would say big up to all of these organizations and groups that are doing so much. Um, I wonder if that's an area that we're inputting into also. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm going to go back and just think about um, when the Māori Occupational Therapy Network came together. And it, it, it was because um, we, we we were coming together as survivors, literally, and it sounds oh. so dramatic, but um, we survived OT school and um, we all had our stories and, you know, people come, we, we still meet and we still cry. Mm. Um, and so it was, it was kind of actually the, how we came about is that we recognize each and each other a need to heal. Um, and that we could support each other through that and that and but it was also that powerful realizing oh my gosh it wasn't just me because you know, of course you know, you guess like and especially when you when you're just one or two maori and you know a class of a hundred you think it's you and then you realize oh no that they had the same and they had the same and oh my gosh they had the same and and so and then i've realized that's actually what's coming together and this global conversation actually is that a lot of us have really similar stories and so what does that mean? Um, well, first of all, for us, we we focus on us. So it's the only place in the world where we get to be Māori occupational therapists when we get together as Māori. So um, that's, we prioritise the Māori part first and then we bring in the occupational therapy as the, it's like kind of who we are versus um, what we chose as a career. And so um, part of that is, 
building ourselves up and decolonizing ourselves and then thinking about really carefully how do we interact then with these other institutions and these other spaces that we've got to you know be part of um, and we can do that in really interesting ways like um you know uh, when it comes to my annual practice and certificate um, I'm, I might choose one year just to write only in te reo Māori oh. so then I know that my registration board has to go and find a translator and translate it so that they know what I'm getting up to you know for their competency but the idea is is that I'm training them to change their institution change their structure and get ready um, so you know but, but you've got to be careful about that because bear in mind that um, uh, Māori do not uh, get to mark the assignments do not get to choose the field work placement and pass you we, we don't get to set a paper in occupational therapy in any occupational therapy schools we don't have anyone leading a module or leading a paper um, in New Zealand so um, we also are not the ones who are going to employ you we mm. are not the ones who are going to help you career trajectory we're not the ones who are going to research your, uh, supervise your PhD because we're not there so we've got to be very careful kind of how we disrupt and just be um yeah I guess very calculated about that yeah yeah and there's something about um, measuring safety in there as well isn't there I'm, I'm absolutely hearing. Yeah. yeah 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 because um because the other thing too is that I I'm I can speak out because I'm not in an institution I, I don't work for any occupational therapy schools. I had a little side job, but um, and and work walking in those margins means that uh, it's actually in a way a bit of a privilege because many occupation many Māori occupational therapists have to work mm. with uh, non Māori bosses as their bosses and as their leaders and all that. Whereas I don't have to. And my the food in my cupboards isn't dependent on. Um, uh, somebody who's non Māori giving me a job and keeping me if I kind of shake things up a little bit. So that's really important. I think you know there's the safety and there's the risk, um, and everyone's got to measure that up. But when you when you're in a group and you're hearing that everyone's doing that to a degree, and it just it, it makes it a lot easier. Mm, mm, thank you. And I wonder if. Um, safety is an element within the next question that I'm going to ask you Isla and let me know if you if you need a break I can switch to Sheila first um but I suppose the idea is why hasn't the needle moved yes regarding kind of anti-racism equity justice and change um in occupational therapy and, and science and and how do we move the needle but I suppose first that question why hasn't this happened yet I think you've mentioned some of it in terms of people needing to still be able to work and have jobs. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say, yeah, that, I think that's it, that the power is still with um, people who are mostly non Māori uh, in this country anyway. And um, so the thing is, is that the power has been um, collected and, and compounded over a long time. So it's really hard to undo that because it's also it's not just power, it's wealth, it's high regard. Um, it's just assuming good and assuming a great service or that that's that's also in that bucket of power. Um, and the other the other part to it, the other complication is that sometimes uh, Māori and we're all on our decolonizing journey, but some um, do believe, and the picture that gets shown, which is we're we're learning, we're trying really hard to learn, we're becoming educated, um, and just give us time. I'm often told to give us time, Isla. You're pushing, you're pushing too much. Um, all these kinds of messages that you know we're making good steps, the tiny baby steps. And in the meantime, like Sheila said in the outset, people are dying too early, too young. You know, Māori, um, we don't live as long. And in my family, we have a joke. We laugh when someone gets to the pension age because it's like, wow, you got the pension age and you didn't die before that. And that shouldn't be a joke. But that's that's why the the, need, the needle isn't moving too because we um want like we keep thinking decolonization is the, is the thing. But even when we've been, managed to decolonize and disrupt the space, they, they get recolonized. So we haven't become savvy and develop expertise yet and and what happens with colonialism that it, it shapeshifts and that it will it will recolonize the space if you haven't 
um, put in an anti-racism measure, anti-colonial measure to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, and so I think it's the other part to it is that if you don't have to uh, be anti-colonial, be anti-racist, then you don't figure out how to. So the people who um, could, the people with the power, haven't learned how to. They haven't imagined a life different um, because they didn't necessity to. Uh, whereas those of us who know a different life um, and, and urgently require a different way of being, um, we don't have the power that goes with it. So, so, so that's why we, again, that's why we collectivise. Sheila's turn. <laughs> Sorry, Sheila. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna turn the question um back to to Sheila as well. But I I just wanted to make a link there that idea of things recolonizing um over time, and it, uh, it may link into what um Dr. David was talking about earlier on this morning with the thermostat that actually um you know someone opens the door and the cool air comes in and it changes the setting again. How tuned in are we to what's happening and how? Um, you know, is there a draft somewhere? It might not be a door opening. There might be a window cracked open somewhere and things start to slowly seep in. So how in tune are we um, to each other as well? Um, from someone from, again, a, a BAME background for myself, you, you spoke, Kyla, about um, some people not knowing any other way. Um, I'm not from my home country. I'm not from Jamaica. I'm from the UK. And it's only from um, groups like this and, and other Jamaicans who have lived on soil where I've been able to learn um what the other way is um so Sheila I'm going to pose that question to you as uh, again the, the same question so why do you think the needle hasn't moved you, you said you know it's important because people are dying um so what hasn't what hasn't the needle moved uh, so this also kind of answers the, one of the questions you asked before about what does colonialism look like today um in occupational therapy um like Isla was was talking about auditing look at the demographics, right? Look at your people. And so OT, um, when it originally started, was meant only for white women of a certain um, certain class. And so look at the demographics today. So add to our countries, Canada and Australia. These are diverse societies, yet occupational therapists aren't representative um, of the, the communities. And so where I live, it's about 84% white. Um, whereas our population is like 60 something percent white. And then you start going up. So um, here it's a master's, uh, entry level is a master's. They're trying to make it a doctorate. And so as you start going up, you start to see that it gets wider and wider and wider. And so to me, that says that we haven't gone very far from those colonial days. Um, it also tells me how elitist occupational therapy is. Um, so then occupational therapy becomes this profession that is exclusive to those with access, those with privilege, um, those with some amount of either power or connections to get into these programs, to be able to pay for these programs. It's like $50,000 a year for a program here. Um, and so OT is classist, racist, and ableist. And so it's really excluding a whole bunch of people. Um, I'd say that's why the needle hasn't moved. Um, and in terms of, okay, well, how do we change that? Um, I am a little, I guess, abrasive <laughs> um, here. And I'd say stop supporting things like WFOT and your national OT associations if they're not demonstrating that anti-racism is a priority, right? We need long-term actions and policies, not just statements, match those statements with actual action. So if they don't have um, what's important to you, which we're talking about literally <laughs> preventing deaths, right? Um, improving lives, um, improving livelihoods, extending life expectancies. Um, if that's not the priority for your OT association, why are you paying into it? I mean, money talks, right? I don't know how many letters I've written. I've done, um, what is it, a town hall. I've got RCOT, CAOT attended, but my state association refused to attend. And so when they aren't showing up, when you're banding together, you're working together, you're asking them for answers and they're completely ignoring you, cut them off, stop paying into it. Um, instead support grassroots initiatives, right? Um, these collectives that I've named, so volunteer, donate, 
think about how power can be shared um, with everyone, right? Um, service users, students, minoritized clinicians. Um, Dr. Dave Thomas talked about this is a we problem, not us versus them. And so if it's not affecting you personally and you're not doing anything about it, that's why nothing is changing. It affects all of us. Um, and then to sustain these efforts, like I said, the volunteer donating, um, we have to pay people. Um, Angie Phoenix um, recently um, talked about, you know, a lot of this work is voluntary, right? And so when it becomes a us versus them thing, there's an expectation um, that BIPOC and BAME and other minoritized people are going to be the ones that are leading the way, that are doing the work because it affects them. Um, but we're not being paid for this work. So then what happens? Um, you're in poverty, your family's left in poverty, right? And so are you supposed to starve to be able to do this work? That's not really fair. So again, people with power, people with influence, people with money, give some of it up. As always, Sheila, I love your, your what, what was it that David said earlier on, your um, critical love challenges. I absolutely love it. Um, thank you there's so much to take from that already um a reminder to our audience and our attendees that we do have the q a function in um the zoom please post questions that you might have um perspectives from international kind of perspectives it, it's always great for us to be here but meanwhile we'll carry on with some of the questions that i do have if that's okay um opening this up to, to the both of you and um, we've touched on it but it's always good to to name it and go through bit by bit again what might decolonization um look like in general and specifically for ot and i think we're at a poignant moment actually globally um nationally and globally um to potentially get into discussing some of these things so it, it's a privilege again to be here today this week um to to talk about this so what what do we think about that what does decolonization look like um i'm gonna jump in here sheila um I, I guess, first of all, um, if you look up decolonization, um, the dictionary is going to say different things. And I think, to be really clear, what, what we're talking about in this sense is that we're, we're not talking about a colonial power leaving a country and that's that's the, and exiting, so-called exiting, that's, that's not what we mean. We mean to uh, remove a colonial way of being as the norm um, in a space. and. Um, the thing though with, with the colonizing work is that it is different where you are and so here uh, for Māori in New Zealand and Aotearoa New Zealand it's it's we want our land back we want some of our land back and we know we're not going to get all of it we have less than two percent but we know that what we do with it um, we we bring lakes and rivers back to health we look after streams um, we nurture our forests back. So we, we know that we're doing really good stuff for everybody when we have our land. Um, occupational therapy um, specifically can help, occupational therapists can help with that by being people who um, are really interested in what their DHBs or, or the equivalent of trusts, NHS, NHS trusts, um, when they have surplus land, and surplus resource, um, quite often they have to advertise it and talk to that and it's the same in our local um, area councils, so tiny little fiefdoms that we have all around the country, they have to advertise and so occupational therapists could keep an eye out for that and tell us where their hospitals, or their health services, uh, their local councils are saying this land is surplus to requirement. And demand actually it needs to go back to the people that it was taken off. And because quite often land was gifted for the purpose of a hospital or a school or something that was in the public good. Um, but it, but quite often, you know, um, it will when it's not needed anymore, um, these spaces like hospitals and churches and that they they will sell it and make money rather than giving it back. So, you know, that's a very easy thing that um, occupational therapists can help. In terms of this country, um, specifically, is to help us get our land back so that we can look after it. Um, 
decolonization inside of curriculums. A lot of people are saying, oh, we're decolonizing curriculum. I heard the other day someone did it within five hours. I don't know what they were talking about, but anyway, it was a bit scary. But um, someone reckon they decolonized their school's curriculum in five hours. I would say they definitely didn't. But uh, decolonization is tough. It's the long haul. It's turning this big ship back around. It's knowing exactly how we got here and the thought processes that led to this over centuries. It's realizing um, history isn't on the path. History was only two minutes ago. You know, we're in it. Um, so yeah, having a very, bringing a completely different lens to how what we think is normal and taken for granted and being humble about it. I really believe that um, decolonization is difficult to do if you're not humble. In fact, I'd say in some things you can only access that through humility because with humility you have this critical love, you have um, genuine empathy, um, you have reverence and, and, and a, a real desire to hear and learn and understand. So yeah, we've got a little way to go. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of work. There, there's healing in there. There's turning time around, recognizing that it wasn't actually that long ago. Um, and like you say, that that humility that also needs to come with that. That that's really that's quite deep actually, and would take a lot of of time and and collectiveness. Um, okay, so I have a question that I was going to. Unless Sheila, actually, did you want to add to that? Did you want to add to that question before I move on? Um, I you know. The two things that come to mind, just like Isla said, land, give the land back and reparations, yeah. um, but really ask people that have been most impacted, right? Um, I think decolonization, that, you know, Tuck and Yang metaphor, uh, metaphor sorry, article um, screams in my head on a daily basis when I see anything about OTOS and decolonization. It's a metaphor right now. Like Isla said, I think it was actually five weeks or five months, whatever it is, you can't decolonize anything um, in five hours, weeks or months. Who told you it's been decolonized, right? <laughs> Where did you even get that from? Um, so ask the people who have been the most impacted. Ask the yeah. people that have actually been colonized, displaced, um, exploited, etc. Yeah. And I think that speaks to the question that I would like us to answer live now. So in, in terms of um, decolonizing, um, linking that in with anti-racist practice, so give back the land listen to those who are most impacted by these things. Um, so we have a question from May Lee. Um, so you mentioned um, holding our national and international organisations to account, Sheila, I think this, this may be um, pointed at yourself, um, and looking for opportunities to share power. What are other specific practical anti-racist actions that we could take as individuals? I can answer, and I would love to hear um, from Isla as well. I know these are things that we have talked about and worked on together. Um, I mentioned volunteer and donate, right? If you don't have the time um, or energy, um, put in some funds. So, you know, the way this works is if we all do it. Um, and so you have to support community. You have to carry some weight. Um, Isla mentioned healing. Who has time for healing? Who has time to pause? That is a privilege. So take some of the weight off of um, <clears throat> somebody else who's doing the work, you know, um, volunteer, like disrupt OT. I'm doing tech support. <laughs> I can't multitask. Um, and so someone could show up for an hour, contact these, these listed all of these um, orgs and OT that are doing this work. They don't have funding. They don't have support. Reach out and ask them what they need. Um, if somebody's struggling and you don't know how to support them, send them a meal. That's one less thing that they have to worry about. And it's really not that complicated. Ask. And Isla, what might you add to that? Um, oof. So I actually um, have walked away from my national organization and so I have quite a few Mario OTs because it's not been a safe space and it's um, there's been a recolonization. So um, sometimes you just have to get out because when the discomfort uh, for non-Māori is experienced as trauma, um, you know, it's discomfort, there's a difference. And when uh, 
for Māori the trauma is becoming re-traumatising, then it's not safe and it's just a, so um, it's actually knowing when, you know, right now is not the time, they, they're not in, in the space and, and at the same time we can keep building as, as Māori OT network and, um, and sometimes it's building something um, that's different, you know, so it's, it's it, you, you don't, necessarily need to take apart something sometimes it's just no I can't participate in that space it's colonial and it would be better for our communities and us that we have another space and um, some people see that as separatist and all that kind of stuff but um, separatist to me just means that you're not coming with me and you've, you've, you've refused you're saying no that you won't come with me so you're that's on the train you know, that's right yeah yeah absolutely and and the same with international organizations i walked away from wfit i was the new zealand representative for that um i was really concerned at a council meeting when i asked about the indigenous uh, project budget and it was 600 american dollars out of a budget for 1 million and i just thought that's not an that's not an effort to, that's not a genuine effort um mm. towards decolonization or supporting so um, yeah, it wasn't good enough. And, and so, you know, uh, I look after my energy and I put it where I know it's gonna actually make a difference. Yeah, and, and going into that from a different perspective. So we, we've kind of answered about holding um, national organizations to account and what we can do as individuals. But as individuals, I think Lee has put a question here, um, as well as holding kind of national organisations to account, how can we hold our bosses, so speaking to power as well, I guess, when we're in a different kind of power imbalance, how can we hold our bosses to account? So I work in a very white, lacking in diversity NHS trust. I'm desperate to find a way to constructively bring this up with the leads of the therapies department. How do I bring this up and question things like recruitment processes without it becoming a BAME or a hashtag BAME problem? So again, that sense of safety and um, it not being put back on ourselves. Don't know who, Sheila, should we go to you first so Isla gets a chance to breathe? <laughs> uh, um you know, that is tough. The reality is that um, most organizations aren't really equipped to do this work, aren't really equipped to not only provide a safe space for their minor minoritized workers, um, uh, for people to not be worried about retaliation if they do speak up, um, and leaders usually don't know what to do because you'd think they would have already done it. And so um, this is where you bring people in from the outside that know what they're doing and pay them pay because because they're doing this work. This isn't, you know, all these DEI groups. And I'm hearing people say, oh, I, I have to do this additional work because I'm the only black person. I'm the only brown person. And so you're tokenizing and you're exploiting and you're adding on top of somebody's workload. Um, pay somebody to do it. Make sure they're qualified. Just because this is my skin color doesn't mean that I'm qualified to do this work. Um, so bring somebody in um, and pay them. And this is where transparency and accountability is necessary. So um, if you have the privilege to ask these questions, ask questions um, about what's going on. Show me this policy. Why don't we have a policy? You can suggest that somebody else has brought in. Escalate, right? Move it up the chain. Um, and, you know, for some of us, unfortunately, nothing happens or again you're retaliated against and sometimes we have to just leave that workplace and it sucks that nothing's going to change but if it's not safe and you can't protect yourself and it's you know doing you harm yeah so there's something about walking with your feet um or talking with with your feet and that kind of movement as well as as we mentioned earlier on about withholding your money, thinking about where you put your money as well. Isla, were you, you going to jump in there? Um, yeah, like, um, I think it's really good um, to collect, before you embark on something like that, they collect your team of support around you and just be, be really aware who in your workspace and, um, and your wider networks uh, would support that kind of um, approach or questioning. And, and also, um, you know, do a shout out and, and, and say who else has done something similar 
um and who's done something similar and it didn't go down well you know because <laughs> you want to find all of the um as much experience and expertise as possible so it's not just those who were hey it worked really well but also look we tried it this way and it just it, it bombed um so i just think it's really important to have that um support team because actually it's not just the small little thing that you're looking at it's actually quite big um and you know you kind of you really are putting your foot on the door and it's a door that it's um it, it's not that it's waiting to be opened it's constantly being closed again um so you just got to be really careful and i think i would um just be aware too that when you go looking for this stuff um there are often rules there are barriers there are things that come in like oh we don't collect that information it's really hard to get it oh so and so is on leave can't give it to you there is all the excuses in the book when you try and get data to monitor uh diversity it's um it's quite interesting so here we've resorted to um, doing what's called an official information act uh, request and institutions don't like that because it does look poorly on them at, um, on the end of your report is that someone had to actually go to the extent of getting a um, you know government intervention to get information but you have to have a bit of a think about how far you're willing to go um, and I'm thinking too about uh, my husband, who is a software engineer. He he, he wondered about um, the idea that not many women are promoted in his place. And he kind of thought, you know, let's just have a bit of a look and see about this. And he didn't think that he would find discrimination or prejudice, but he did. Um, and but it, so he, he he approached it as he was just going to do a general review. It was kind of going lightly across everything, a desktop review, if you like. Once he found stuff, it was like, oh, OK, dig in. And then, oh, boy, dig in. But then being um, someone with some privilege and power in the position he had at the time, he just kept pushing. And then it became really clear. He pushed until he got enough evidence to say, yeah, actually, there's discrimination here. Um, and there's a gen gender uh, inequity for sure in terms of pay. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so there's a lot of different ways that you can approach that, um, and, uh, but I do think, you know, bring your team with you. Yeah, Br bringing a team with you, asking questions whilst you're leaning on the door as well. Um, and another question similarly to, to leaning on the door, it, it feels as though um, we're asking a lot of kind of around prof professional bodies at the moment. So a question here from one of our attendees, how do we, again, that pushing on the door demands that the professional bodies engage in this through actions and measures in collaborations with the structurally minoritized and marginalized groups? Um, Sheila? Um, this this is a tough one. I, I, I wish I had mm. um, an effective answer. Um, so in the US, we have um, a network, um, the multidisciplinary MDI groups, basically there are affinity groups. They've been around for about 25 years um, and they've been demanding that AOTA, our national organization, um, hear what they have to say. They just wanna work together. Um, you know, they have their networks, again, their, their affinity groups. So like BMO UK, however, they've been around for 25 years. Um, and so um, there's, I can't remember how many, but there's, there's a handful of them um, and nothing has happened. Um, and so the reality is these groups are growing. So, you know, we have to continue to be loud. Mm. Um, but my belief is that sometimes you can't do the work from within the system and you have to disrupt it from the outside, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's how I feel about politics as well. You vote around certain people. We aren't gonna change everybody's mind. We aren't gonna get everybody involved. Um, we're not all gonna be on the same page. That's the reality that I'm willing to accept and work past, right? So how do we work around them? Um, how do we disempower them and take some of that power back is how I see it. Um, you know, Isla, had some really great suggestions. Maybe I'm a little bitter, but I've tried to do this before and I've left a bunch of workplaces because people don't want to speak up. They're comfortable where they are. They oh. see things that are being done. They see patients being harmed and they don't want to get involved. So what do you do when you've asked everybody, they've seen it, but they don't want to say anything, right? So, um, you know, as far as the professional bodies, Again, this is where you get involved with these 
um, grassroots organizations and you build the power and you build the voice and you just get louder and louder and you don't let it go. Yeah. Definitely. And I think, you know, even BAMO team maybe has been as an example of, of doing something potentially from the outside and putting pressure on, on bodies for, for outcomes. So thank you for that. So again, using our money, using our feet, using our voice, um, having a team, doing things in a safe way for yourself as well, I'm, I'm hearing. Um, just a comment here from, from Maylee speaking to the kind of what we said before, asking people what they've done previously, um, sharing the information and not being perceptive, not just simply saying, yeah, it won't work. I tried it before. It won't work for you either. Coming together and actually having a discussion about what happened, how that worked, why it didn't work potentially as well, um, and being community to each other during that process. So yeah, definitely. Um, let me have a look. So thinking about um, the global OT community now, Sheila, what, what do you think you've learned from connecting with OT professionals and students, um, some that are retired and semi-retired as well, um, from across the world? And I also just wanted to make sure before I start yapping on if Isla wanted to add anything to the previous question. Oh yes, of course, Isla. Apologies. You're muted. It's going to happen once, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah. I was, I was sorry. I was talking to myself thinking, what did I want to add to that? Um, I think that it's, it's very tricky. Um, there, I think the thing to keep in mind all the time is that those with power would like to hold on to it. And um, it is okay to perform sharing power for them. Um, so it's, it's not just having them um, be held accountable, it's also being able to discern what the difference between performing looking like you're doing something as if something's happening versus not probably really. And you'll know that it's, you, you know when it's been done right because you know you've got these accountabilities beautifully balanced with support. And you can have really open, trusting conversations where you're gently calling in or out, but you know it's in a relationship where you know each other. Um, like I was saying before, there's you know that critical love, there's that humility, and it feels like you're in this community of learning. Now, if you don't have that in that space, um, that means that there's power issues, um, which I would say probably for most places like that. I don't know, are there any mainstream spaces that do this well? Like, do you guys know any? Because I don't know any. I know a lot that have tried. And I, I know a lot that have um, celebrated and bragged that they've done it, they're doing a great job and they're really not. So um, I think I'm a little bit like Sheila, like I don't hold out a lot of hope that these guys are gonna add the answer to this and they're gonna change much. I'm not looking to them for the answers. Um, uh, Chelsea Wittigo, um, an incredible First Australian author, she talks about hope, how hope is, is just that deep breath you take before you end up having, a, you know, being submerged kind of thing. And um, we've got to be careful not to, I think, um, I guess it's just a matter of discerning that sometimes hope is used in a way to um to lock us down to stop pushing um so yeah you've got to keep pushing but if you're pushing in an environment where it's accountable and supportive that's okay yeah i love the the theme of hope today it seems to be quite strong right from again dr david's um talk earlier on is it hope is a force and you've mentioned actually hope is something that's precious where do you choose to put your or what do you choose to put your hope into it's something that's very you need to be careful like you say and, and discerning as to what you're putting all of your hopes into um for risk of i'm guessing losing momentum and and energy as well okay thank you thank you both um so yes we'll, we'll go to um the question about the global OT community um, before we round up. So, so Sheila, what have you learned from connecting with OTs across the world and what might your hopes be for the global OT community? So I 
think there's a lot that we can learn from one another, um, well beyond things that we can learn from books <laughs> um, and practice. And so, you know, I've, I've been able to meet with just exceptional people through Disrupt OT, and I'm recognizing that there are far more people doing like life and system changing work. Um, and these aren't people that we're hearing about. These aren't people with all the accolades um, that are speaking at the conferences and being published um, and getting all the credit. But from my viewpoint, they're impacting lives far more significantly than these OT celebrities. Um, and so I think, you know, we have to connect with places that we're not familiar with, with languages that we don't speak, um, so that we can learn um, from, from these people. Um, I've also just seen um, so much empathy and people living through disasters and extreme conditions and losses, people living in countries that have been severely exploited and have far less resources. I'm in the US, I'm very privileged, and they're, they're so concerned for me and us, um, yet it's not, it doesn't usually go the other way around. Um, and so my hopes, okay, I'm gonna, <laughs> I know this is recorded, um, but my hope is those of us with more privileged power and resources start to give more of a fuck about the people that don't um, and that we do something about restoring the balance. And Isla, would, would you add to that? I have found um, that being involved in a, in a, a global community like Disrupt OT and the International Indigenous Consortium, it has it's more than just um, a breath of fresh air. It's, it's become a lifeline um, because you know you gaslighted for so long as an oppressed person in your own country. And um, it's just, you know, people see you. But more than that, they share the same imagination for a decolonial future. And that is just so hopeful. And that's when you start to think, oh, my descendants could have it much better, possibly. So, um, yeah, I, me, myself, personally, have, um, you know, I've, I've stayed in OT because of it. Yeah, put it that way. I've hung around. <laughs> yeah definitely and we're glad you're still here <laughs> we're so glad um thank you so much Sheila Isla my sisters um the audience so the attendees that have been in and put questions through for kind of engaging with today's topic um that hasn't been postponed that hasn't been put to the side you know we've stood up to the mark today and said yes now's the time to discuss this and, and we'll press on so thank you for that um, I'm sure we can agree there's so much to take from this in terms of safety, discerning, um, coming together, the themes of hope, the themes of decolonization, what that looks like um, specifically. Um, so we're going to be taking a bit of a break now. Um, there's going to be a 15 minutes break. Um, we're going to step away from the screen. We're going to move around for a bit. Um, we're also, it's worth mentioning that we're planning next year's symposium, we've mentioned it before, um, but there will be some money being raised from this point for things like speakers, um, tech, things that we need to practically put together for, for next year, which we can do by raising money on that for the GoFundMe. Um, in the break, if you want to catch up on anything you've missed on the symposium platform, please feel free and see you shortly at 2.45 for the next panel of clinicians. Um, so we're going to have a break and some post view now. So thank you so much for that. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, Isla. Um, and I hope we've managed to answer all of the questions effectively. See you all soon. Take care. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, Sheila. <laughs>